making all things new. The cross of Christ is not a pretty picture. Isaiah 52, 14 prophesied, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was even a man. Our Lord was beaten beyond recognition and was mocked and scoffed as a fool. His body hung on a criminal's cross for all to see. His execution was not performed in a clean, controlled environment. He was put on display for his enemies to vent their anger, for the government to issue their warnings, and his followers to fall to pieces. But out of this horrible, violent event would emerge new life. New life. If this part of history ended on Friday, then we would all still be searching for hope. We would be sad this morning, not glad. But glory be to God that Sunday was coming. Amen? We weren't left out on Friday. We weren't just left there on Friday, but we were brought right into Sunday, right into Resurrection Day. The resurrection of our Lord is what gives us hope. It's the power and promise that allows us to face one day at a time. Millie, it's because of the resurrection that you will face one day at a time and be victorious. Every day will be a day of victory because of what the Lord has done, not what we can do ourselves. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. Verse 15, and we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead, and if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith again is useless, and you are guilty, you are still guilty of your sin. In that case... All who have died believing in Christ are lost. Verse 19. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. Verse 21. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. New life. Christ came to die on a cross to make all things new again. A life of sin and separation from God will beat you beyond recognition. Do you know that? Sin will beat you. It will mar you. It will make you ugly. Have you ever seen photos of a person addicted to meth? Meth is a very powerful addictive drug that's kind of taken our nation by its grips and just bound people and still binding people in just into sickness and death and, you know, in bondage. And if you've ever seen pictures, those who get addicted to this drug, they literally can look decades older than what they really are. Their face, their skin begins to deform. Sin will change how you look.
when Jesus hung on that cross, the weight of sin was so upon him that the Bible says we couldn't even recognize him. He had been beaten so much by sinful man, we couldn't even recognize him. Sin will beat you into oblivion. Sin will always, my friend, take you farther than you ever wanted to go. And it will not only take you farther than you ever wanted to go, it will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. And not only will it take you farther than you wanted to go and keep you longer than you intended to stay, but it will cost you way more than you ever wanted to pay. That's what sin will do. It will take you down that path. And it doesn't just push you there all at once. It just lures you down this path, taking you farther. Come on, just a little bit further. And there you are. And then you're hanging out there, and then you're paying a dear cost. That's what sin does. Jesus went to the cross so you can be set free from the power of sin. He was marred to make you beautiful. He was beaten so you could be healed. He was mocked so you could be accepted by God. And He was separated from the Father so you could become sons and daughters of the living God. Aren't you thankful for Jesus this morning? Amen. And friends, He arose from a, clay, from a closed and guarded tomb so that you would have eternal life and all things would be made new. Jesus makes all things new. It doesn't matter what you're going through this morning. Jesus wants you to experience a life in Him that this world cannot give you. You cannot make enough money to buy it. You can't achieve enough awards to earn it. You can't do enough good in this world to even deserve it. All you can do is surrender your life to God and then you will enter into a life you never knew existed. Because it's new life. You haven't been there. The only way you can get there is through Christ. And when you come through Christ, all things become new. Later on in this service, there's going to be a line of people over here who have chosen to follow Christ, to come into a new life through Christ. And they're coming into this baptismal pool. And we're going to celebrate what God has done in their life and what He's about to do. Amen? And maybe you're here this morning, and this message is getting a hold of your heart, and you have yet to come into that new life through Christ. Friend, today could be the day that you come to Him and begin a new life in Christ. And then you'll just come up here and get in the back of the line, and we'll also baptize you. You will dry off later, but hey, we'll baptize you right today. We will put you right in that pool. I can't find any evidence in the Scripture that it says go through a 16-week course before you're water baptized. It says believe and be baptized. And so today, if you believe and you haven't been water baptized, we will take care of that before you go. Even have extra towels right here, just in case. For those who saw the drama we performed this week, you watched a young girl struggle with a big, big decision. She was young, she was unmarried, and she was pregnant. How could new life come out of a situation like that. Seemed hopeless, seemed impossible. But as the dancers reminded us, all things are possible in God. All things. The pressure to abort was upon her. The fear of rejection was upon her. Life was spinning out of control. What would she do? And as you know, if you were here to see the drama, this young lady decided to choose life. To choose life. She gave her mess to God in hopes of a miracle. What some of you know, but many of you don't, is that Jessica, the character's name 
in the drama was a real person. So real that she's a member of this congregation. She was even one of the actresses in the drama. And this morning I've asked her to come and have her share with us the rest of the story. So would you welcome Kim Fridley to come and share with you. that I just swallowed my gum <laughs> and I do know that it is not proper etiquette to stand up here and talk to a crowd of people with gum in your mouth so praise God <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to tell you all first of all can I see a show of hands of how many people were able to come to the drama Wednesday Thursday or Friday night awesome awesome so I kind of want to tell you a little bit if you weren't there I actually played Linda the mom, like Pastor Greg said, of, of Jessica, the, the pregnant teenager um, in high school. However, 27 years ago, um, I was that pregnant teenager in high school. It's very important for me to um, tell you that <clears throat> I grew up in an amazing Christian home. My parents were awesome. Um, family and church were everything to us. So you can imagine the shock, the disappointment um, that not only my family felt, but my church family. Um, I was a huge part of my youth group, and I disappointed a, a whole lot of people. Um, after a lot of prayer and, and just talking and processing everything, um, we embraced it. Um, we realized that God had a bigger plan, and no matter what, there was going to be a little baby born in our family. And believe me, my family embraces babies. Um, so uh, nine months later, uh, it just so happened, I think it's important to tell this because God is so amazing. Um, my sister and I were pregnant at the exact same time. Our due dates were just a couple days apart. She had married a couple years earlier, and she and her husband had moved to Pennsylvania. And um, she had her son, Seth, six days before I had Tyler. And so my parents were in Pennsylvania. Um, I went into labor. They had it all arranged. Who would take me to the hospital? Went to the hospital and gave birth to a beautiful baby boy, six pounds, ba beautiful. And... Um, it's something how God will immediately give a young teenage girl motherly instinct, motherly intuition. Um, Tyler was born at about 8 o'clock at night, and that whole entire night, 27 years ago, they actually kept the baby in the nursery and let the mom get rest. They, they fed him. They did everything that whole night. And all night long, I heard a baby crying. And every time someone, a nurse or someone would come in, I'd say, is that my baby? And they just brushed it off and said, um, you don't hear a baby crying. So early the next morning, a doctor that I'd never seen before came in, and he said, um, you need to get up, you need to get dressed, and you need to call somebody to come and get you. Um, Tyler is very sick, and he needs to go to UVA to the NICU. So I called my dad. My mom had actually stayed in Pennsylvania. My dad had come home to be with me. And... Um, of course, not knowing that there would be issues, he came and got me and drove me to UVA. And uh, the neonatal intensive care unit, wow, what a place. I remember walking in, and keep in mind, I am a young, immature teenage girl, and there were little incubators everywhere. There were babies in there fighting for their lives, including mine. I'll never forget I really, really wanted to go to the gift shop and get Tyler something. So my dad took me down there, and I found this music box. And it had the poem Footprints on it. And I'd never read that poem before. And I read it, and I was like, oh, I have to get that. I mean, God is so carrying me right now. So we got the music box. The nurses put it in his little incubator with him. And they told me every time it played Amazing Grace, they, they said every time that music box came on that all of Tyler's levels would just shoot up, that he just loved to hear that music. So 
the doctors came and told us that he really wasn't strong enough. He actually had um, major heart abnormalities, that um, he really wasn't strong enough to have open heart surgery yet. So they were going to wait for three days till he was three days old, and they were going to do open heart surgery. So the third day came, and um, it was a long, long day. Um, lots of family, lots of friends. Um, we made the best of it that we could. I remember it was like eight or nine hours, and um, I actually walked out to the hallway and got a drink of water out of the water fountain, and I remember looking up, and it was literally like something out of a movie. I looked down the hallway, and there were all these doctors and nurses walking towards me. They were still in their, their scrubs, and they were giving me thumbs up and smiles, and they said, Kim, it was textbook surgery. It went awesome. And you're going to bring him home in 11 days. And for the first time in three days, we had hope. So we decided, we were sick and tired of hospital food, that we would leave and go to a restaurant. So we figured out as a family where we were going to go. We had to document it with UVA. And as soon as we got to the restaurant, we had just gotten our food. And they came over and they said, you need to go back. Don't worry about your bill. You just need to go back. And I remember being that young, immature teenage girl thinking all the way that ride from the restaurant back to the hospital thinking, I wonder what's wrong. I wonder what, what could be wrong. And we get back to the hospital, and they tell me that Tyler's heart just stopped 20 minutes ago. And I knew that that's when my feet hit that exit door of that hospital. And I had walked out of that hospital. And the enemy immediately told me that he died because I left. And I want you to know that our God is so amazing that he immediately took me, he let me off the hook. He immediately said, Kimberly, this is not about your timing. This is about my timing. So they brought Tyler to me. For the first time, he didn't have tubes and tape, and you have to remember his issues were all internal, so he was just perfect. His body was perfect. They had put him in the clothes that I was going to take him home in, and they brought him to me, and I held him. And I remember seeing nothing but a face of peace. And I remember thinking, only our God can take a six-pound little baby boy and give him the face of peace. And friends, what God did for me is he wrapped his arms around me. He loved me. He helped me to walk through everything in the next couple of days that I had to walk through. And I want you to know he will do the same for you. I know that I'm going to see my son again someday. I know that. I may go out here today. I don't know how I'm going to die. I don't know when I'm going to die, and it doesn't matter because I know that I'm going to see my son. And he will do the same for you. God will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never cheat on you, lie to you. He will never divorce you. He will never physically or mentally abuse you. He will never hand you alcohol. He will never hand you drugs. He will give you hope and peace and an eternal life. This life is... For such, it's a journey that is so short, and eternity is forever and ever. And I know that I want to spend it in heaven with Jesus. And I urge you, if you've not made that decision, don't walk out of here today. Do not walk out of here today, because you don't know. You don't know the time or the place. Only God knows. And thank you for letting me share my story. Real stuff, people. This is real. Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out 
find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Have it to the full. The only way to make real sense out of tragedies that happen in this life is to know that this is not the end of life. Without the resurrection, these losses, these disappointments, these wrong turns in life, our sin, it would leave us in despair every single day and living for nothing. And yet, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we know that we too shall have life. We shall have life. But that life is through Him. He said, I am the gate. You know the devil's plan for your life, and you know he does have one? He does. The devil's plan for your life is to make a bigger mess of it. And then, for you to live in it until you die. He would love to see you turn your back on God, curse Him, deny Him, till the day you die. And friend, I believe most of all, the devil's plan is to strip you of any and all hope. How do we even breathe without hope? And yet, God has a plan for your life too. He does. God's plan is to give you life. His plan is to take your messes and do miracles. He wants to lift up your head, not beat you down. He wants to bless your life, not curse it into defeat. He gives you hope so that you have a future. So friend, today, as I, invite the, <clears throat> as I invite the worship team to come up, friend, today I ask you this. Are you living in the new life of Christ? If you are, today is an amazing day of celebration for you. As a matter of fact, every day is Resurrection Day. Did you know that? For those who are in Christ, every day we walk on this earth is a day of celebration of what God has done for us. Every day, no matter what we face, no matter what's waiting on you at work for tomorrow, no matter what's waiting on you at school tomorrow, no matter what's waiting on you at home today, because Jesus is not in the grave, you have hope. You have hope, and you have hope of a new life. You don't have to be marred and disfigured by sin anymore. Jesus has come to pay the penalty and to break the power of sin in your life. Now, that doesn't mean that the presence of it has disappeared because, friend, you're going to run into the presence of sin at every turn. There it is. But because you are in Christ and Christ is in you, you have the power to say, I don't think so, pal. Not today, my friend. No, I'm walking on a different path. I'm walking on a path of hope. I'm walking on a path of new life. I'm not going to be marred and scarred and beaten down and disfigured by the sin and the bondage of this world any longer because my king lives. My Jesus is not in a grave. He's not hopeless. He's full of hope and life. And I have that life. That's what we have. So friend, if you have that hope and you have that life, praise God. Praise God. But if you don't, friend, I just echo what Kim said. Let today be the day of new life. Let today be the day that you, my friend, shall be born again, born into life in Christ. You know, sin always promises you 
that you'll live another day, another year, maybe forever. Nothing, you're invincible. Look, we don't know the time. We couldn't have predicted Tyler's time. You can't predict yours either. But I can tell you this, that if you've entered through the gate of life that's in Christ, it doesn't matter what time it is anymore. Time is no longer an issue, my friend. Because you live forever. And what you do with your life on this planet now is to live for the King of Kings so that others can enter in through that gate as well. To bring others with you. To share with them. To to love them. To care for them. To share Jesus with them. To pray with them. To offer them hope. That's... That's the time, that's what we need to be using our time for. Is bringing others, showing them the gate of Jesus. So friend, today, if you need that new life, we're here for you. We really are. We're here to pray with you. We're here to receive you. Perhaps this morning, you've, um, You made this decision. Once in your life, you made this decision. But since that time, friend, you haven't been walking with Christ. I want to see you do more than just believe. The life of Christ is one that is full and abundant. And when you walk with Him, you get to experience that life.